This is Saving the Game, a Christian podcast about tabletop role-playing games and collaborative storytelling. Recorded Monday, August 10th of 2020, it's episode 183. In this episode, ghosts, plus our favorite musicians, resurrection versus undeath, an important PSA about carbon monoxide, and more. Welcome to Saving the Game. I'm Grant. I'm Peter. And I'm Jenny. Judging by our pre-show conversation, I think I know how everyone's doing. But for the sake of the audience at home or in their car, but most likely at home, how you doing? Negative 16 out of 10 or so? I'm not quite that bad. I'll start with my bad day since Peter's is significantly worse. I am never notified by public works when I'm at work and they're going to do something. And normally this isn't the biggest of issues, but one, pandemic. Two, they never wear masks, ever. And three, it's normally something minor that like they can do after I've gone home. But today I got to work and there was a gigantic hole in the ground beside the wheelchair ramp. <laughs> oh, no. That's a bit of a problem. Uh, by hole, I mean a ditch about six feet wide going all the way along the building, between the building and the wheelchair ramp. Laying something down, I assume. I, I was not sure for for a while because there was just this machinery like backhoe with the hose still in the dirt and everyone had gone to lunch <laughs> and like this massive truck. And like, and I have to use my parking lot right now for curbside pickup circulation stuff. And they were blocking like everything. Nobody told me. And so, you know what they were doing? They will. They were doing stuff to do with the grading of soil so that they can pave it, which I have been begging, begging somebody to like, let me do for ages because it's just this big patch of gravel right next to the library. And what kids love to do is shove as much of that gravel as they can into my book drop box, which is unkind, but I'm glad they're having fun, I guess. They're finally paving it. I'm very glad about that. But because they were doing grading work, that means they were using a particular tool, the name of which I, I don't know, but it's like a jackhammer. But if the hammer bit was flat and so they are just pounding earth down there, tamping it down with this industrial level tamper. And it's literally shaking so much that I had book stands falling off of shelves. Wow. I'd have loved to have been able to prepare for that. That was a solid hour of my day. And then it was sandwiched between another couple hours of backhoeing. And of course, as soon as I finish my work day, they up and leave. So it's not it, like, like it's it was just they started the noisiest part of the work just as I was getting my workflow going. I had to change. I had to change tasks to like menial, mindless work because I had a full big planning day planned. And I was just like, no, I am I am having to catch things falling off of shelves. Like, I, I can't do uninterruptible things right now. So yeah, I would just love for my town to let me know when they're gonna do stuff to my building that's gonna affect my work. But that'll never happen. That'll never happen. That, that, that seems, yeah. Here's what's happened to me in the last 72 hours. I went in to take the Microsoft 70, 70, 40s exam. I thought I was prepared for this. I was scoring 89 to 92% on practice exams. I went in and I failed it badly because there was a whole bunch of stuff on the actual exam that the practice curriculum didn't even touch on. I am not going to publicly name names of the company, but that didn't work. But I will say that if if anybody listening to this is going to try and do a Microsoft exam between you know, now and the end of January of 2021, please PM me and I will tell you which company to avoid. That was bad enough where I actually wrote a formal email of complaint, which is something that requires things to go pretty badly for me to even consider doing, much less actually do. So that was unpleasant. My desktop PC has died on me. I cannot even get it to power on, um, as in I can't even get the fans to spin up. It has a known good power supply in it, which means that something that set of symptoms means that something is wrong with the motherboard, the processor or the RAM. And because I don't have any other hardware of the same generation here that I can swap around with, I have no way of testing to figure out which one of those it is. 
the next time I'm going to be back at work where I will have uh, access to some of that hardware is two days from now. <sighs> so that's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm I'm recording tonight's episode on my laptop. So good times. Yeah, or something like that. There's also been like a fried power supply and a home server that doesn't work because of it now and just big technical head. Yeah, big, likely to be expensive technical headaches. That's extremely frustrating. Absolutely. Yeah. Grant, how are you? <laughs> I'm actually pretty good. I, I'm, I'm actually glad to hear that. I, Aside from, you know, the state of the world, I'm largely fine. We were very fortunate. We have been very carefully, so you know, about very almost quarantine levels of like not going out to see people. Right. We're not going out to eat. We're not doing anything. Yeah. And as a result, we sort of spent some of that health capital, if you will. OK. And went down to see a friend of ours because they are very good friends. They uh, well, their family owns a beach house on the Isle of Palms in South Carolina near Charleston. And we got to use that and we got to take our kids because they have kids that are like a year older than our kids same genders and so it's like oh you know the girls get to go play and the boys get to go play and they just get to go have fun together right we basically got to actually give our kids some face-to-face -face interaction that they have been desperately needing because we have both have been like really you know both families have been very careful about who have we seen you know do we have any symptoms at all uh i recently had a test because my allergies that got real bad and the doctor was like ah, you should just check it's like all right no turns out it's fine so we spent that and that worked very well, because we had a really good time. We ended up actually watching all of the kids for a little while. Chrissy and I did. One of the friends of ours has a, uh, a close family member who was in their last days as of this recording. So they were mm. visiting them. You know, it's it's kind of a, an unfortunate situation there. Also in Charleston. So we got to go see them. We were down there and we could do that, right? We could watch their kids and they could go say goodbyes and sit with family and that sort of thing. That's nice. Yeah. So that kind of worked out. But more than anything, the kids got to just run around, play on the beach, have fun and, you know, wear themselves out. Be children for a while. Yeah. Also, we got to actually go out to the beach early in the morning, at, like just after sunrise and play around. Some of the pictures that you guys shared in our gaming groups discord were just jaw dropping. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely beach. It really is. Understand, Isle of Palms is a very expensive area. It right? looks this, fancy. It's super fancy. Right. This is where the poolside, you know, rental manners are and the condos and stuff. I don't know. I look I, I live uh, in a very sandy area. And any time I see a house that's like super freaking close to the water like that, I'm like, oh, wow, you can you can afford to replace that house if a wave comes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the kind of area that is too expensive for people to put large condos in. <laughs> it's like, oh, um, no, this is this is relegated to individual, extremely expensive rental mansions or people who have enough money that they just own the land outright. Mm -hmm. Wow. These guys bought in when it was dirt cheap because the Isle of Palms is one of the barrier islands and its job is to absorb hurricanes for Charleston. So for a long time, it was not considered especially valuable. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but now it is. Uh, and so, you know, the families owned these for a while. We were very fortunate to be able to just go down and, and go to this beach house. So we had a lot of fun there. It was good to just get out on the beach, stretch our legs, and just see people. We didn't do anything. We took a bunch of board games, didn't play a one of them, <laughs> um, you know, but it was mostly just sit, talk, collapse about an hour early and go to sleep and then wake up and make coffee and head out to the beach. So it was it was lovely. That does sound nice. I'm. It was I'm glad you guys had a good experience. So. Yeah, I mean, we're going to be careful for the next week or so, but the most contact we had with anyone other than them was like one old guy whose dog was out and just is this old black lab who would just come up to the kids, drop a tennis ball at their feet and just be like, you're going to throw this in the ocean for me? Huh? <laughs> yeah. And of course, the kids did. And then they just had all dogs like, I'm so happy. <laughs> it's been kind of a complainy 15 minutes. We should probably do something fun. Who says we roll on our table of questions? Here, yeah, shall we? yeah, let's yes. let's do that. I could use some fun. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to roll the die. You can't stop me because I've got the die right here and you are several states away at least. That's a two. 
All right, this is uh, from Douglas Underhill. All right. Longtime contributor. And he asks a very simple question. What is your favorite band slash musician? Uh, these days, probably Cobra and the Lotus. They're a Canadian hard rock metal band, female fronted. Their lead singer seems like like a literal delightful person. She seems very kind and decent and her songwriting reflects a lot of that. They have a lot of lyrics that are kind of designed to either point out injustices in the world or just be encouraging. A lot of the time with heavier music, you will run into, well, your stereotypical lyrics about sex, drugs and rock and roll, right? This is I have referred to the Prevail 2 album by Cobra and the Lotus as music to become a better person to. Hmm. I like their sound quite a bit, too. But yeah, it's kind of the the whole package there. So that's my picks. How about you guys? It changes fairly frequently, but right now it is Sean James. I, I recommend checking out uh, Sean James, The Curse of the Fold. That's my favorite song of his. It reminds me of The Witcher a lot. Uh, it's sort of um, acoustic, folksy, grim folk. I won't. Hmm. I, it's it's not. It is definitely okay. Anybody who doesn't know anything about the goth music genre might call it sort of gothic. It, it's not, but it's it's got some grim but hopeful themes. Interesting. It's like a, acknowledging that that stuff is is bad, but you should keep going anyway, kind of thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll link specifically Curse of the Fold in in the show notes because it's. Oh, I, I love that song. It's very sweet. Good. Cool. I mean, I have some musicians and bands whom I could probably identify as favorites. What's weird is I don't listen to them very often. Uh, <laughs> I know that sounds odd. In high school, my favorite band was U2. I was on a huge U2 kick. I still have like every U2 album. I was buying singles, etc. Right. But I would say probably the one that I think a lot of our listeners might enjoy is David Lamott, whom I've re uh, referenced a time or two. We actually got permission to put one of his songs at the end of one of our episodes. I don't remember which one for the life of me, but it's there. If you go back, tell you what, go listen to our whole backlog. You'll find it. And <laughs> yeah, we've only got 183 regular episodes and 21 bonus episodes. That'll knock that out in a week. You'll be. Yeah, fine. yeah you'll be fine. I, I really do like him. If you like very uplifting folk music, great choice. But I mean, if you just look at my my Spotify recently played, there's the Dicey Dungeons original soundtrack, Boards of Canada, Nor, Tom Petty, Haim, which is a wonderful uh, all-female rock group, What's uh, Death Cab for Cutie, Chai, which is Japanese girl uh, rock group, uh, Morch Kowalski, which is modern synth wave. <laughs> it's I am all over the place there. Oh, oh there's some Doom Tree uh, and Dessa. I mean, Jessica Curry. I, I'm all over the place. Pop wins. And, and that's because I love finding new stuff. I, I like a lot of indie music. I like trying to find new music. And I there are not many genres I dislike. Maybe country. I don't like new country. I like very old country. Um, yeah, those are very different genres. I was going to say, will you at least yeah. make an exception for Johnny Cash? I, you know what? I don't like Johnny Cash. Um, oh, I, I, I was like... talking more to Grant about that one, but oh, yeah, yeah. fair enough. The only Johnny Cash song I like, and I have listened to several, is Ring of Fire. Hmm. OK. Uh, and Hurt, uh, which is not technically his, but it's functionally his well, Trent Reznor even acknowledges that that's his song now. So, yeah, yeah. And it's it's only good because it is Johnny Cash, the person singing it. It, it is a lot less meaningful if it were some random person with the same voice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Knowing his personal history definitely gives that song a whole different meaning. At any rate, I do love trying to find a lot of fun and interesting music. I mean, I have I have ridiculous numbers of playlists and stuff. Have you have you tried math rock yet? I love math rock. How, have you listened to Tricot? Um, They're a Japanese mostly girl group that does math rock quite well. <sighs> Tricot? Yes, I believe okay. I have. Give me just a second. Yeah, played a few bars of one. Yes, yes, I did. OK, they're, they're quite good. They're very good. Uh, the cabs might be my favorite of those. I have yet to find another math rock band that I like. 
Oh, that's that's fine. I I recognize that the the genre is like right up my alley, but a lot of the ones that I found have been like really really indie, and it's like you guys are going to be great when you find a good producer. <laughs> yeah, uh, you might like, and so I watch you from afar. I will. I will. I try don't it. know. I do, they're not Japanese. These this actually I have shared this with Peter before. Gangs, Peter, that that all instrumental rock album I sent you a while back, oh, like several years ago. Yeah, I have some vague memories. I don't think I've listened to it a whole lot since, but I mean that's entirely fine. Gangs is just an absolutely incredible album. If that's the one I'm, shoot, is, do I have the, the name right? Yes, Gangs from 2011. So absolutely amazing metal that doesn't have any words in it, and that that makes it better because I like I like metal until people start singing. That's music. It's funny because there's so many different kinds of metal vocals. You would think you would have found something you liked there, but eh. I just wish people would stop growling over perfectly good guitar. But there's there's plenty of varieties where they don't growl. <laughs> it, it all devolves into growling eventually, and it's just very annoying. I'm, I'm being facetious. It's fine. Yeah, yeah there, there, there's there's more of a there's more of a conversation to be had here, but probably not on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah, it's I love listening to like technical metal music and i just people need to stop trying to sing over it that that's our music discussion and thank you douglas as always good questions and if you want to get your own questions in please go ahead and do so we are running a little short on people with sending in questions we have enough of a backlog for quite some time but we'd like a variety i know that our randomness has missed one or two people and i might cheat the dice over the next couple ones because there's a few folks who um haven't had questions read and they've had them sitting out here for a long time. So we need to I need to kind of make that a little more fair. Maybe I can find a way to like wait this system or something. To the best of my knowledge, this episode will drop before uh, the actual first session of the City on a Hill campaign that I am running, which is exciting. Ryan said that there were several things, several episodes queued up ahead of it. So he had some other content all set up, ready to go. Uh, which is awesome. I thought it went fairly well. Jenny, unfortunately, is not in this one. She's got plenty of other stuff going on. Totally under- understand that. Peter was in it, and yep. we, I think, got off to a pretty strong start. It's a D&D thing. Uh, it's going to be like five to seven sessions, which is actually my biggest hurdle. Because, Peter, how do I run games? Long? Yeah. <laughs> it's It's, by and large, give you a problem, sit back and watch you flail at it until it's fixed like five sessions later, right? Yeah, you you do tend to kind of follow the give characters reasons to interact with each other and put interesting problems in the world model of GMing. Yeah, which I think is very strong for a long running campaign. When you are on a deadline, I'm sitting here going, this seems so obvious and yet I feel it must be done. You know something, though? I don't think anybody, anybody, except for maybe you, is going to complain if we wind up running longer than that. Ryan has been stuck GMing for quite some time. You are a very good and entertaining GM to play under. And if this winds up running longer than five to seven sessions, you're just giving Ryan more content. Uh, Okay, I will grant you that Ryan is getting more content, but, you know, that was the original thing you know yeah I'll, if we do a follow-up thing i'm sure we could easily make that happen but i gotta say i like the characters i like how they're kind of presenting themselves yeah i think everyone's sort of settling in there is this cool kind of trifecta of like so and so knows people so and so know places so and so knows uh flora and fauna so and so doesn't know anything at all and it's funny and it's you know we have this kind of knowledge-based dynamic that's cropped up in the group from the session zero, and it's sort of playing out in the first session, and I think it's working well. Yeah, it's just to give you an example, like my my character is kind of like a bodyguard slash security specialist. He's a Oath of the Crown paladin in the rules terms, although I think he's going to get some different tenets because uh, those don't really gel with how Faramond is. But um, yeah, he doesn't really like... He is relying on uh, two of the other player characters to know where we're going and know what the differences in nature means. He is basically just there for if a threat happens, I protect the rest of you. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And he is very good at that because he is an Oath of the Crown paladin with like 
Level seven paladins are disgusting in 5e, y'all. Like, <laughs> yes, it's very silly. I, there was a wonderful moment and I don't want to spoil this too much, but uh, you guys are on a wagon and you just sort of hand the reins off, walk to the back of the wagon, hit something and then walk back and like, there we go. Did about a third of that thing's health. <laughs> yeah. Uh, give me the reins back. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. And I have to say, I think that first combat was a lot of fun. Again, I don't want to spoil it too much, but it was it was a very dynamic scenario, which was a lot of fun. That's the kind of thing I enjoy running. And I think it plays well, you know, as a podcast where there's kind of action happening all over the place. Well, and you embraced the fact that especially after the second campaign, like you, you basically just need to understand that city on a hill parties are just not going to kill people <laughs> like ever <laughs> like fights against other bipeds are probably non-starters so we we didn't fight other bipeds <laughs> that's exactly right but peter hmm. did we in fact fight giant insects we did do i apparently have a thing for throwing giant insects at my parties you do especially <laughs> as like introductory monsters <laughs> Turns out to work really well. Yeah. Ah, uh, good times. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. I thought another it... thing about my bad day. I uh, I ended up covered in insects at one. Oh, oh no. man, that's. Yeah, I I don't even know when it happened, but at one point I went to the washroom and there were just bugs on my shoulders, and I was like, "This is bad." And you know what? Everyone feels that, so that's why insects are an excellent starter. Villain. It's true. Yeah. Starter bad to punch because everyone wants to punch ants off their shoulders. <laughs> oh, it's true. And when you take a wasp and I'm yeah, and I say, well, you know, these are only about seven feet. They're hardly the worst thing out here. <laughs> it's a good start. Yeah. Everybody just, you know, even though we don't have video running, everybody just kind of looks at each other through the Internet. And then, <laughs> yeah. yeah, these aren't even the worst thing out here. Huh? OK, hardly. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, and I would recommend that anybody and, and I say this not because it's me doing it and I'm going, whoa, ha, ha, I'm such an amazing GM. Everybody, I thought, played really well. There's a lot of fun happening. Everybody's sort of playing into the sense of urgency, which I yeah. think is wonderful. If after like eight years of listening to a podcast with Grant and me, you're curious what it sounds like when he GMs an actual session. Now's your chance, you know, That's like true. very much like how Grant GM sessions in general. So there didn't do anything out of character for him in this. And it, it worked out well. So, no, oh, I'm glad it's a lot of fun. And I recommend you check it out. City on a hill gaming dot com net org dot net. If I uh, actually City on a hill gaming dot my... com. Yeah. Hey, there we go. I should know these things. Oh, wait, I lie. It's already out. Oh, no, no. Sorry. That's the session zero. That's out. Um. That's a good thing to listen to as well, though. Yes, that was a lot of fun because the second part especially involves us talking about like safety tools and how, you know, what goes into that special considerations for the fact that this is a actual play podcast. Uh, but also, you know, I, I did some fun stuff like, OK, Peter, tell me one thing that is true about this setting. Yeah. Which I think caught everybody off guard. And now we have like a a hospitable like desert tribal society that Faramond is part of that we might get to visit someday. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah. There's all sorts of cool stuff that happens. So anyway, yeah. it's a lot of fun. Check it out. We have a big topic, possibly our biggest scripture reading ever to get to. So we should dive into that. But just to wrap that up, uh, if you want to support us on the show, patreon.com slash saving the game, please go ahead and do that. That helps us a ton. We're talking about ghosts tonight. And that means we have a lot of scripture sort of related to that. And one of those is the longest bit of scripture about ghosts in the Bible. Oh, you shut up. We're not doing this. No. No. We have a different podcast. <laughs> different podcast. All right. I'm going to try and uh, read. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now Thank you, you know. Now you know. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, I've I've always known. Sixty. Oh, oh, good. Hi, Moon Eye. <laughs> uh, Dumbus decided to be on the. Yeah. Okay. Go on, Tweedle. Stupid. We have the chapter twenty-eight of the first book of Samuel. First Samuel twenty-eight. We're not going to quite do all of it, but it's verses one to twenty. You'll see why this is relevant in our conversation with ghosts. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, 
Understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. David said to Achish, Very well, you shall know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, Very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Divine for me by a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a god coming up out of the earth. He said to her, What is his appearance? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek, Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell at once full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. Job 14, verses 7 through 12. At least there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again, and its new shoots will not fail. Its roots may grow old in the ground, and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put forth shoots like a plant. But a man dies and is laid low. He breathes his last and is no more. As the water of a lake dries up, or a riverbed becomes parched and dry, so he lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, people will not awake or be roused from their sleep. And Isaiah chapter 8 verse 19. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? And we have two passages from Matthew. The first is Matthew 14, verses 22 through 27. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And we have Matthew 27, verses 51 through 54. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this is the son of God. We are talking about ghosts tonight. Ghosts. Apparently we are just kind of doing a Halloween in late July and early August because, hey, why not? 
Yeah, whatever. Creepy. Cosmic horror and ghosts. OK, yeah, indeed. It's fine. And so ghosts, ghosts are one of those things that are pretty much universal. We all sort of have ghost stories, no matter what our culture is. And so we kind of have to ask ourselves, what are ghosts all about? And my take on a ghost, and you guys may quibble with this some, but my, my take on it is that ghosts are sort of the echoes of people, a spiritual manifestation of the effect we have on society and on the world and on others, and a manifestation of how our people and our world affects us, right? We have the, the ghost with unfinished business. The world has this effect on us, and we, we need to do something, accomplish something, see something through. Feeling is so strong that it carries through even to after death. You know, there's a haunting where this person did something horrible, and the, the echo of that lingers in memory and thus in, in, in spiritual reality in a place or in a thing or about a person. There's also a sort of a combination of the two that I have seen in Ojibwe culture specifically, mm -hmm. where it's a combination of unfinished business with haunting. So because a sibling of somebody has done something culturally significantly bad, the resulting death of the sibling causes a haunting. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. I actually, it was interesting. I was talking about recording this episode with one of my coworkers today, and he mentioned that he'd seen ghosts described as like a weird temporal displacement of events, too. There's a, a very good horror movie that I cannot remember the name of, and thus this is entirely useless. But there is a wonderful South American horror movie that plays into that theme, hmm. where the haunting is weird events that have happened due to time, you know, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff to, to quote the doctor <laughs> as a result of that disappearance. And, you know, this this very terrifying thing and people appearing in places and weird voices are, in fact, this weird temporal nexus in a house. So that's the interdimensional hypothesis. Yeah. Which is it, it doesn't just apply to ghosts. It's a sort of an idea surrounding UFOs and unexplained events. It's just like eh, sometimes dimensions just cross over a bit. Right. Sometimes um, there's bleed. Yeah. It's one. Of, it's it's honestly one of my favorite plot devices ever forever. It's, oh, it's so great because you can explain literally anything with it and be like, oh, no, it's consistent. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. It's great. Understand, when we talk about ghosts on this podcast, three of us, we're going to be talking about them with the cultural knowledge that we three have, mm -hmm. which is certainly not e complete. We don't have every bit of cultural knowledge of ghosts from everywhere, right? So when we say something, please keep that in mind, all right? that That's going to be important going forward. We're not going to harp on that, but just be aware of it. I, in particular, was looking for some very specific books, but a certain... A certain warehouse in Calgary didn't send a certain library some books in time. So I'm a little less knowledgeable about this than I wanted to be, and I'm kind of mad about it. That's unfortunate, and I am sorry. There are lots of theories of ghosts, but by and large, when we talk about them, if we say this is a spiritual phenomenon and not something else, we're talking about some sort of spiritual remnant of a person. Yeah. A lot of the time, it's just a disembodied soul. That's yeah. stuck, you know, some sort of emotional resonance is another thing that's often yeah. proclaimed, right? Really, really strong negative emotions are usually what you see there. Things like sorrow or rage. Yes. And it is interesting that when we talk about ghosts, we are usually talking about uh, negative influences. I have a theory on the positive side of things. I think that's when people start invoking the guardian angel rather than a ghost, at least in terms of Western culture. Ghosts are seen as malevolent like 99% of the time. But as soon, as soon as something positive and inexplicable happens, guardian angel. The average actually gets more positive for them in fantasy, though. Yeah, that is true. I think it's because fantasy is already making you suspend your disbelief about a lot of stuff. And, and so it's like, yeah, we've already got, you know, people with pointy ears that live in the forest and shoot real good and can see, you know, a bajillion miles away. Why don't we just have nice ghosts this time? And I think it's drawing off different traditions. Look at Shakespeare, for example. Hamlet's ghost is, you know, he's not a violent ghost. It is not the ghost that you get in yeah. a 
horror movie, a, you know, a ghost story. It's a ghost that needs vengeance, but cannot do that itself. It, it comes to Hamlet and says, I, you know, you are my beloved son. Please help me, you know, help your father, you know, rest because vengeance. I was killed. Yeah. Avenge me. And that's drawing from very different influences. And to be sure, it is also a plot point, right? It's the reason to have a bunch of murders and soliloquies, but it's fine. There's another aspect of the malevolent ghost as a modern Western phenomenon that plays into similarities of fear of death brought about by specific political events, oftentimes war. A thing that I think I've noticed, the malevolence of, of zombies and ghosts goes up when wars happen more. I mean, that makes sense. So you've got a lot of like traumatic death in a war. So, so the more that a culture is made aware of traumatic death, the more likely that the malevolent ghost and zombie is going to become prevalent in pop right. culture. Right. That's interesting. I, I can buy it's that. It's a thing we talked about a little bit in, in first year film class, which was a bunch of years ago for me now. So it's like old memory, but. So let's talk about the theological bit of ghosts here. The Bible doesn't actually have a ton to say about yeah. ghosts. Yeah. And certainly the Western presentation of ghosts is largely absent I, I think we actually pretty much read you just about everything that can be interpreted as ghosts in the Bible. And it's mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I, I want to touch on is a couple of those things I would argue aren't actually ghosts at all. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. The, the Witch of Endor um, is communicating with the soul of Samuel from the afterlife. But apparently, yeah, yeah I mean, that's 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 what it leads us to believe anyways. Yeah. yeah. Samuel was in the afterlife. It, if we go with the presentation there before she called on him and then he came back and was like, yeah, boy, you have really screwed up doom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to the afterlife now and you'll be joining me soon. See ya. And that does tie into the Jewish traditions of death at the time, which is just almost Hellenic in a way where it's just you have a place you go, but any interaction with them is you, you have to call them up. Yeah. Right. You're calling them up from the land of the dead. Yeah. And Jesus's followers briefly think he's a ghost when he's walking on the water. But obviously mm -hmm. he is very much alive in that. And there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of like straight up resurrection in the Bible, like more than you probably remember. There, There's a couple of passages in the Old Testament that I don't even have in here, but just following Jesus around, he raises the son of a widow. He raises Jairus's daughter. He raises Lazarus. Of course, you know, he himself is raised on the third day after his crucifixion. And then there's that story from Matthew where apparently a bunch of like old saints were also raised from the dead and walked around and interacted with people after the crucifixion. All of these people are actually alive again. They are not ghosts. We had an episode where we talked about the difference between resurrection and undeath. Mm -hmm. there, there's th this is not a perversion of life. It is life. You know, they are back. Yeah, exactly. The only other th bit of scripture that I think we did not read is the transfiguration where Elijah and Moses join Jesus on the the, the mountain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But even then, that's not presented as ghosts. That's just presented as them. And there is a qualitative difference between the ghost of someone and the person, even after death. Like, if I say those phrases to you, I think we all kind of go, oh, yeah, those aren't the same thing. Yeah. Because the ghost is, it's like the 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 molt or the shell of someone. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. It's like, even if it is their soul, a lot of the time it's like obsessed or confused or, and I mean. It's incomplete. Yeah, incomplete is, is exactly the right word. And actually, I, I think that probably kind of leads us into, I mean, that's that's about all that there is for the theological slash biblical side of this. You know, the, the Bible yeah. doesn't dwell on ghosts very much, but fiction does, as we mentioned earlier. And there's a lot of interesting tropes around ghosts. And let's let's get into some of that. Those are fun. I Yeah. And I want to talk about how we use ghosts much more than like what they can do, because ultimately yeah. what ghosts can do is, I don't know, what's convenient for your story and what makes it feel like a haunted. I'm going to go a little bit further than that, just to say that, yeah, that's true. But pop culture, media, folklore, that sort of thing has nailed down a certain 
I don't know, suite of ghostly abilities that are pretty common. And we most people probably know these, but I would like to go over them just for completeness sake. Sure. But let's start with kind of what ghosts do. And we've touched on some of this already, right? We've got the unfinished business, the ghost that needs to do something before they can pass on or see something through, whether that's you know the ghost of Hamlet's father, the ghost of Patrick Swayze, <laughs> whatever it is, they need to see something done and either they can try and do it themselves, a la Patrick Swayze, or they need human intervention to see it done. And this is the most common one so that they can then rest. One thing that I, I want to throw out here is this can be almost anything as long as it was important enough to the person who is now a ghost. Th this can be something incredibly mundane, like I want to see my children get married. And what happens if one of those children dies single? <laughs> it can be something noble, like I need to slay this horrible monster. And the fact that I am a ghost does not release me from my nightly vows. I think one of the classics is I need to remember how I died. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a good one. Yeah, it's it's one that, that shows up fair amount. I also I think this is where with both fantasy and sci fi games, you can really mess around with ghosts that aren't human. And as we sort of mentioned in Cosmic Horror, have a motivation that is completely inhuman and almost so beyond what you can understand. It's just like, I accept that you want to have your ashes scattered on the the dark side of the moon and then, you know, have me dance around like I've got hot coals in my shoes. But like, why? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it can be something awful and terrifying. The agenda of a serial killer could potentially be something binding a ghost back to the mortal plane. And that gets very much into horror. Jenny, you mentioned horror, so I, I wanted to get that before we got too far away from it in the conversation. But you can you can have an instance where the ghost wants something absolutely unacceptable. And now what? Yeah. Time to punch it in the face. In the ghost yeah. face. Well, and <laughs> the thing is, I think that's the most interesting type of ghost if I'm being perfectly honest, because that turns it, especially in a role playing game context, it is no longer a combat. It is a puzzle or it is a it's a opportunity to solve a problem. I would actually say that the one where the awful is good, like that gives you moral dilemmas and stuff. But the impossible or seemingly impossible is, I think, the most fun as a puzzle. And that's that's why I used the example of I want to see my children get married and one of the ghost's children died single. Well, mm -hmm. you know, like is seeing your grandchildren get married good enough. Are we doing a ghost wedding? Yeah. Like, <laughs> what are what are we doing here? You know, <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> no, I, I agree. But that, that's the thing. Present a puzzle and be like, all right, how are we solving this? And that's always fascinating to me. It's especially good if the ghost itself doesn't know if what you do is going to work. And you can do that a couple different ways. You can make the ghost, you know, not able to fully communicate or you can make the ghost just sort of be like, I don't know, give it a shot. Yeah, I'm stuck in this cosmic trap. Doesn't mean I know how it works. You know, can I give a shout out real quick? Legend of the Five Rings, fourth edition, lovely book, lovely game, very crunchy, but quite good if you like crunch. They have a section in the main book about ghosts in the kind of, you know, monster manual piece of it, right? They don't actually list stats for ghosts. They're just like, look, they have stats like they were people, but fighting them doesn't solve anything. Put a you put a ghost away. You let it go to where it's supposed to go through spirituality and conviction and problem solving, not violence. Yeah. And I always loved that about that book because it basically says, hey, this is a quote unquote monster, right? In that it is something that is not a human and that could potentially be violent, but you cannot fight it. You've got to find some other solution. There's still social combat mechanics in L5R. Oh, yes. So even if you're not physically punching the ghost or trying to punch the ghost and failing, you still have mechanics for back and forth with the ghost. My boyfriend Tyler is in a is in a, a an L5R Let's Play right now. Uh, for oh, excellent. Strife. And yeah, so so and they do deal with ghosty mechanics a little bit in there. And it's 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 pretty interesting. Because I keep forgetting to talk about it. No, well, you know what? Let's plug it. Fortune and strife. Because I got to say, I love L5R. Peter and I were in a attempt at a um, uh, an L5R game for a while there, and it was pretty good. It was a lot of fun. 
Nice. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I don't have nearly the level of investment in the setting that you do, but it was a fun group of people that I was playing with, so I was willing to give it a shot. So I yeah. can tell from listening to the show that I don't think I'd enjoy playing it that much, but I do enjoy listening to other people play it because it's an excellent story generating machine. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I, I like crunch. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's right up there for me. And another game that I do want to shout out, and I'm I know I'm kind of jumping around here because we're talking about role playing games now and we're hey, we're, we're supposed to be talking about haunting tropes. But there is a game that handles part of this really, really well. And that is who guessed who could have guessed it? Unknown armies. <laughs> but they have a whole section. There's no just standard ghost. There's lots of different types of ghosts, all of whom are obsessed with something in particular. And so they kind of list, hey, this is how they behave. Now it's unknown armies. They put a weird twist on it. But again, it's you can't fight this thing. You have to somehow break its obsession. And I always thought that was a nice approach. Unknown armies has a particular conceit in that there are no bad guys. You know, there are no opponents who are not human. There are maybe a few things that are summoned by humans. There are a few things that are created by humans, and those are problems. But ultimately, the real opposition is other people. And ghosts fall into that because they're other people who've just happened to die and now leave this revenant behind that needs or wants something. Revenants are kind of a different type of undead, but... Well, in this case, revenant is sort of the collective term for any sort of undead, and most of these are ghost-like. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's one that, you know, is is roaming around in the cold looking for its lost child, things like that. Right. That definitely plays into that, that stuck version of the ghost, right? They are stuck like a, like a, a, a tape loop or a skipping CD trying to do one thing over and over, hoping it works. Yeah, yeah. that kind of goes back to a, like a little bit of the, the temporal displacement kind of a thing where it's just like stuck in the same pattern over and over and over again. It's, it can. Yeah. In this case, it's more about the the person rather than like some weird time stuff. But yeah, it's yeah. But that that idea of repetition is in there. Yeah. And I think we see that a lot in ghost stories, right? It's the ghost that always does the thing. You know, Ichabod Crane is always galloping down the road headless, you know, looking for his head, looking for his head. Speaking of that, let's do just kind of get into the ghostly capabilities. Like I said before, just kind of for the sake of completeness, most of the time they have they're not going to look solid. They can be invisible or they're at least like semi transparent. A lot of the time. They have, you know, that kind of um, ephemeral look to them. So that's that's a sometimes I I think my favorite ghosty ones are where they don't look like ghosts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they aren't transparent. You don't necessarily know they're a ghost. We were talking about L5R a moment ago. Japanese ghosts are notable because you can't see their feet. Interesting. That's one of the ways that you know, but otherwise they look like perfectly normal people. Hmm. So if one's standing behind a counter, you have no way of knowing. (laughs) Right, exactly. And so that's one of those. There are different cultural signifiers for what a ghost is among different cultures. Huh. Mm -hmm. One that I don't see nearly often enough, but I really I've seen it described in books is like similar to fairies. They look pretty dang normal, but there is something that looks off about them and you you cannot tell what it is. Mm-hmm. Like maybe their smile is a little bit too wide or they speak with an awkward lilt that you just can't. And, and so, there's just something off uncanny valley ish. Hmm. Yeah, those those that's always a lovely approach to it. Invisibility is an interesting one, though, because there is the idea that they come and go because they're not material. They can just sort of be there and then not be there. Right. You turn around and the, how many classic ghost stories involve you turn around you look back and they're gone yeah yeah that disappearing is is definitely a, a trope yeah. right or they only show up in mirrors or yes like or in a particular camera uh, uh one of my wife's favorite games is um fatal frame for the original like playstation playstation 2 era consoles and that's that was the whole trope there is you had to look through this camera i.e go into a special view mode in order to see the ghosts and then snap pictures of them but that idea of being able to see them or track them and through some special item because otherwise you can't see them. I mean, we even see this in Ghostbusters with the EKG meter. 
you, ha- you have to have some special thing to be able to find the ghost and see it when it doesn't want to be seen. Yeah. Poltergeist sort of stuff where they can throw things around. This is typically, you know, specific to that sort of ghost, but you see it a lot. Objects fly around the room in a haunting sort of situation. But again, that's a very Western sort of ghost story. General, what we would consider psionic abilities like telekinesis, uh, telepathy sometimes. Or at least the ability to always be understood. Yeah, or sometimes like one of the things that you'll see in fantasy is ghosts can project visions of past events into people's minds. That gets used a lot with kind of like messenger style ones where it's like, you know, look into the past kind of a thing. And of course, yeah, fear abilities are very common, like beyond just like that person is dead and yet they're still talking to me. They'll sometimes have like an aura that uh, frightens people, like taking on a really like scary, monstrous appearance, especially like really briefly as a jump scare gets used Mm -hmm. in movies a lot. One of the more common and awful like legendary things is they'll appear with the wounds of their death one that's been hanged their head will be at like a weird angle and sometimes you'll see like a ghostly noose trailing off or you know a beheaded one will be carrying their head or something i mean nearly headless nick from harry potter i was just thinking that where <laughs> it can be played up for comedy as well yeah like you said earlier beyond kind of that cluster of abilities it's Whatever you need for the story. Some are are pyrokinetic, you know, that you'll see a ghost like burn a house down or set fire to it and then, you know, like chase people out and then the house will still be there the next night or. Yeah. Possession uh, is sometimes a thing. Yeah. Breaking things, a possessed or haunted house literally kind of be its own entity as much as the ghost in it, that sort of thing. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that that goes into it that is really just what sounds cool at the time. We kind of touched on this a little bit, but how do we use them in stories? The fun part is you can use these pretty much however you want. I would say Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with this. The worst way to use the ghost is as a monster to fight. Yeah, like something with stats. Yeah, that's that's kind of boring. If you need to fight against spectral undead, like wraiths and alips and shadows and that sort of thing, Those are there for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But when we talk about a ghost, which has that trait of I'm stuck here, I'm the echo of a person, not just I'm a spooky see through monster, then please use it as a ghost, not as this is a specter. It does four cold damage and make a save. You like, please just Mm -hmm. use the right right tool for the right encounter and situation. Okay. Yeah. I like ghosts as puzzles or indicators of puzzles. We did a inspectors game briefly and, you know, a long while back. And that was a lot of fun because, you know, when we had a ghost, it's like, OK, well, here's a ghost. What's it trying to say? You, you showed up to try and get rid of this ghost. Well, why is it here in the first place and who needs to get rid of it? Yeah. What is the problem? It's something that someone pointed out to me, unfortunately, after I watched Crimson Peak for the first time. A well-done ghost does not need to hurt anybody to get their message across. None. And and it's sort of kind of spoilers for Crimson Peak, but mm. none of the ghosts in Crimson Peak ever hurt anybody. Hmm. Never. They are, and I should have seen this coming because it's a Guillermo del Toro and Guillermo del Toro is all about the monsters aren't the monsters, humanity's the real monster kind of thing. Of course. A really good ghost, I think, should probably never actually harm anybody. At least not not for a specific, not not for like a gothic style mystery horror-ish puzzle. They should be an indicator of, you, you know that something is going on, something is wrong, I'm going to help you figure out what it is because I am invested in something to do with this house or with the people that you're with or with you. I am I am somehow invested in this. I recall there being, I think, three ghosts in Crimson Peak and all of them are invested in the main character's safety for different reasons. And huh. seeing how they show up differently is super, super cool. Major, I, I really like Crimson Peak. I haven't ever 
actually watched it all the way through all at once because I do get scared. And so please, everybody stop calling it not a horror. It actually scares me a lot. Don't be like, oh, it's not that scary. There aren't any jump scares. I'm sorry. There's a bloody looking lady dragging herself across the floor. I'm going to get scared about that just because I know she's not going to hurt the main character. Doesn't make a, a, a creepy red skeleton lady crawling across the floor not scary sorry that <laughs> that's okay that feeling's been stuck in there for a long time let it out <laughs> i think that's that's also another thing i find ghosts a lot scarier than most other monsters and horror stuff so i i don't consume nearly as much ghost media as as i would like. although one of my my initial uh introductions to horror was a, a yet another ghost story where I don't think the ghost ever actually hurt anybody in their ghosty form. Uh, they were a terrible person in real life and did do awful things. Yeah, Dreadful Story by Catherine Reese. Or Rice? Reese? Rice? I'm not sure. Another good example of a ghost that is puzzle kind of thing. M much less uh, physical interaction with the ghost, though. It's more like dreams and visions. Uh, yeah, d definitely like... It's horror for 12 year olds and I was at the perfect time to read it and it was fantastic. ghosts as puzzle deliverers and also the, the ghost as puzzle. It's oh. fun and it's fun to make up to to throw at players. I was actually preparing for a really good ghosty story right before uh, like for the kiddos right before the pandemic hits. I was full of ghosty ideas. And I do like ghost as ally, not yes. somebody who, you know, is going to necessarily solve your problem for you. But the the tag along ghost who just sort of tells you things is really cool. Mm -hmm. I used yeah. one of those to very good effect in the first full length D and D campaign I ever ran. There was this ghost of a snow elf. He was he was bound into a sword that my wife's character had, and he would relay information and occasionally like could inhabit the sword for a short period of time and kind of wield it in fights. And it was neat. The sword had a bunch of like frost powers and yeah, so they can they can be fun allies, even in kind of like a high fantasy action-y kind of a thing. That certainly works. I do like the idea of the ghost is just, again, the tag along where they're not really fighting for you. They're not giving you any powers, but you're sitting around the campfire and talking to your ghost friend that only you can see and being like, hey, so uh, do you know the story of this place? Oh, yeah. When I was here, you know, Hey, 400 years ago, this looks completely different. You know, that kind of thing. I like the theory uh, as well with ghosts. And this is sort of a bit of an aside, but like the way that they can walk through walls is that there used to be a door there. Yes. Ah. Uh, and so I, I just love the idea of sort of absent minded ghosts forgetting that things have changed because they're stuck in a particular time period. I love that. Yeah. Or that, you know, well, I'm timeless. This wall won't be here, you know, in 200 years. I mean, it barely exists if you. Yeah. Consider all of eternity, very Discworldy sort of approach. There is no spoon. There is no wall. <laughs> it's, not like that. it's just like, I mean, if you consider the length of eternity, this wall barely exists at all. I mean, I could just walk right through it, frankly. <laughs> it's a Terry Pratchett approach, but it's fun. Although I suspect that unless you're running a very specific game, like a Ghostbusters style game, if you are explaining the mechanics of ghosts, you might have run off the rails. Or you might be playing a whole party of ghosts, which is something I've wanted to do for a very long time. That would be fun. We would perhaps be remiss if we did not at least acknowledge the fact that Wraith exists as a game. Yeah. I don't know that it's necessarily what everyone wants out of ghost stories, but it is certainly a game that exists and meet, met some people's needs. And met a certain amount of critical acclaim, too. It, it bears oh, no, mentioning, I, like... I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it is because it got so heavily white wolfed. It's not always the most ghost story of ghost games. Well, and it's also harsh, heavy and grim. I mean, the, you know, it's got an award winning book about the Holocaust as part of the. I did say white wolf. But I mean, yeah. a lot of the time, white wolf can be kind of like action horror. You know, it's yeah, like it's um, you, you, the stereotype of a vampire game being superheroes with fangs. Wraith the Oblivion is not that. <laughs> no, that is true. And, and credit to it for being that. What else can we use ghosts for? I mean, that's really the big one for me. The messenger is fun. The harbinger, I think, is excellent. I was really hoping to have to have read uh, the woman in black at this point, because that's mm. a ghost who signals the oncoming death of children. I, th I think I would know for sure if I had the book, but I don't. <laughs> Thanks, ULS. 
I'm sorry. Yeah, but that's sort of it's sort of similar to the whole thing of like, hey, here's the puzzle. Um, and and I, I think it can be used as a sort of like a way to sort of jump scare the players into, you know, getting back on track. <laughs> Mm. Not necessarily like jump scaring, jump scaring, but like, hey, remember that there's a plot, please. Can we stick with the plot, please? Yeah. I don't know. I don't have a ton of other things to say about the role of ghosts in stories, but to a certain degree, it's like, I think a lot of us, if you've read well, I feel like you can pull these out from your stories. There's so many ways to use a ghost that we'd either spend five hours talking about it or just say, hey, ghosts exist. Go go read a bunch. Yeah. Which is kind of uh, my solution. I, I would say go read a lot. We haven't directly mentioned it, but I would also recommend reading Johnny and the Dead by Terry Pratchett. It's not one of his his Discworlds. Uh, it's about uh, a boy named Johnny who meets a bunch of ghosts. Cool. And, and it's very funny, hmm. very Pratchett style humor, but not in Discworld. And I think it's intended for middle schoolers. It's really, it's a sweet version. The ghosts are sweet for the most part. At one point, they have to try to make a phone call and they're all like working so hard to try to pick up the phone receiver and then dial every number, but they're on a time limit. Oh, they're nice. Hmm. Sweet. (laughs) That's fun. Yeah. And that is something maybe to play around with. If you are really getting into having a ghost around, don't just think about what they can do. Think about all the things that they cannot do. Things that are struggles for them. I do remember reading a story, and I don't remember if it was Discworld or if it was some other ghost story. It was a ghost who was trying to figure out how to move things and, like, focusing all his energy and just getting a little zap out of his finger and just barely managing to move one little thing. I think that's Johnny and the Dead. That sounds like the Johnny and the Dead section where they're trying to pick up the phone. Then it must have been another Discworld book because that might have been because there is another one that plays into that same idea. And I I really do want to say it is Terry Pratchett. Okay. because there's another Discworld, I think, that plays into those because it wasn't there was no phone. Okay. Would it have been Mort? No, no, there was something else. Okay, some sort of Discworld book that had a ghost. It might even not have, have been Discworld, but it's that idea of like learning you know the uh, ghost learning how to put all of their efforts together you know mm-hmm. put all of their energy into just like these little tiny things and yeah it, like the expression of energy ended up being what actually allowed them to move things i think you could do a really good analogy kind of thing with ghosts as representative of chronic illness sure absolutely could there's a lot in there mm-hmm Hey, if you're looking for an essay idea for your for your gothic lit class. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I like it. No, I think that's that's a fun one. A couple other notes on ghosts. There there are a lot of real world explanations for hauntings. Yes. And some of them are health related. Yes. This, this is my particular soapbox. If you are experience, if you have moved into a new house, especially or a new apartment, and you are suddenly experiencing supernatural things, check your carbon monoxide detector, please. Because some of the, the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning, especially early stages, like confusion, memory loss, sometimes straight up hallucinations, a lot of people interpret that as ghosts. Like there's there's this one Reddit thread about this guy who had a little bit of missing time kind of things going on, and he... And, ended up with like a lot of post-it notes just posted around his apartment that were not in his handwriting. It, it turned out it was his handwriting, but it was his handwriting when he was hallucinating. Oh, and no. he was ending up with carbon monoxide poisoning and some lovely person saved his life and was like, yeah, it's probably not your landlord, you know, sneaking in. You don't have to change the locks. Check your carbon monoxide detector, please, please, please. Yes. Um, and again, not saying if you've like had a supernatural experience that it definitely was carbon monoxide poisoning. Please just rule that out first because it kills people. Yeah, it really does. It's awful. Uh, apparently, one of the things with carbon monoxide poisoning hallucinations is that they make sense at the time and you don't realize it until you're pretty much dead. I've had one hallucination in my life as a result of um, hitting my head in a particular way and doing stupid childhood games i'm not even going to get into it. it yeah it made sense at the time and then when i sort of came to it was like that was weird yeah and with carbon monoxide you might not come to so yeah. so please 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 
Carbon monoxide detectors are really important, especially with all of us staying inside more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, do get that checked. But that kind of brings us to a a discussion of how to use ghosts in a very realistic way where there is somebody who thinks they are haunted or you're having to decide, is this a haunting or is this something else? Infrasound can cause a lot of weird sensations. It can cause you to feel cold. It can cause you to have shivers. It can cause you to feel like you're being watched, feel like you're very uncomfortable because you're getting this low rumbling that you can't hear, but that your body is aware of. And it's like something is wrong here. There's all sorts of, of basic reactions that infrasound can have. And guess what? In modern houses, we have a lot of infrasound roads you know, vibrations can cause infrasound, you know, a a refrigerator can cause it. It happens all the time, right? Low level vibrations and stuff produced by devices can absolutely cause this sort of thing. Is this you just setting up to recommend paranormal home inspector? I mean, not entirely, (laughs) but speaking of, um, there's a, there's the worst best show that I have seen (laughs) or maybe best worst show would be the correct way to phrase that because it is not a good show, but it's a wonderful show to like have a drink and watch or get a group of people together and laugh at over pizza. Right. Uh, Paranormal Home Inspectors. I don't know what platform it's on anymore. I had to dig deep into the weeds to of the internet to uh, watch it at some point. You you probably not that you should pirate anything, but I'm seeing a lot of stuff on YouTube. Okay. You could probably find a lot of it, a lot of clips at the very least on YouTube. And what's wonderful I'm seeing full episodes. These things are 31 minutes long. <laughs> well, it did not have high production values and it was not produced by any major thing that I saw. It might have just ended up there. Right. Mm-hmm. Whoever owns the rights to it might have literally have legitimately dumped it there. I don't know. Yeah. The conceit here is it's the classic, you know, ghost hunters style. You know, we we found somebody who says their house is haunted or, or this place is haunted and we're going to come in and look for the ghost and try and suss out the ghost and communicate with the ghost. So you have your psychic trying to talk to the ghost in this person's house and this person, reca- you know, explaining like all the weird things that they've had. But the twist that the show provides is that they then bring a home inspector in. And they use the same home inspector for this. And this poor dude is (laughs) it's the best scully I have ever seen (laughs) because it's this no nonsense black dude who's just like you. You said you left and came back and, you know, things were on the floor. They own a cat. (laughs) They own a cat. Of course, it knocks things over. You You know, our dishes rattle, you know, at strange times. They live 150 feet from the uh, from a freight railroad. Yeah, <laughs> things are going to rattle, you know. Well, the, the homeowner said that, you know, the they got locked out and the door didn't even have a lock. Well, here's the lock on the door. <laughs> you know, just this very put upon person who's just, well, these closet doors aren't uh, aren't hung straight. So, yep, they're going to swing open at night. Absolutely. They'll swing open all the time. So it's just it's it's wonderful because it gives you maybe one of my favorite things about how we interact with the paranormal, which is we want to ascribe meaning to random events. And sometimes random events are just things random that events. happen and things that are in our environment, but they have to be meaningful because we're human and we like that. And a mishung door is not meaningful, but we really want it to be. And it's much more fun and much more meaningful to think our house is haunted than I'm, I'm going to have to straighten this entire door frame. We, but it's not even that. You just don't think of it because obviously there's a ghost. Not obviously we bought a 70 year old house in Canada where there's a lot of sunlight and the house expands a lot and then it gets cold and the house contracts and there's a lot of weathering. Our house is not quite that old, but like just because we have ice and then heat Mm -hmm. our house is settling and it is it makes weird sounds and sometimes there's a massive cracking sound and we're like probably just the house settling and then we go and we find out that yeah our floorboards are coming like spreading apart slowly because the house is settling yeah and yeah Mm -hmm. i mean we get that here right southern heat causes a lot of expansion in the the roof 
So you get mm-hmm. little, little creaking and popping sounds as the house cools off at night, right as the kids are going to bed. You can't imagine. You cannot imagine how many times I've had to explain. No, don't worry. It's not a ghost. There's nothing alive up in the attic. It's just physics in the house. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's the attic itself that you're hearing. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. But we want to ascribe meaning to these things. And this is a wonderful show that does that. Now, bear in mind, it is also an awful show. <laughs> OK, I have to stress this. It is not a good show, but it is a fun show in that way. So I've, I, I'm i not going to say I recommend the show, but if you are looking for, for a source for that sort of thing in your game, you could do a lot worse. And I, I mention it as an example of a way to think about hauntings if you want to bring that in. Because sometimes, you know, if you're running inspectors, maybe it's a ghost, maybe it's, you know, just you need to get your freezer fixed. Yeah. But it's fun to say, but what if this time it's and go from there? I got nothing else. Neither do I. Yeah, I'm cool. tapped. <laughs> Let's wrap this up here. Uh, I want to hear your own thoughts on ghosts because I'm sure you have a lot of them. Please share this episode around. If you have uh, people you think would chime in on this in a fun way, that helps us more than anything. And of course, if you are new to the show, you can find us at savingthegamepodcast.org or stgcast.org. We're on Twitter and Facebook as Saving the Game. And we are on just about everywhere as far as podcasts go. If you've been sent this, you know, through some way and you want to know how to subscribe to us, we're on, you know, iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, I keep saying Google Play. It's now Google Podcasts. They have their own app because they've kind of split that out away from YouTube Music. And those two things are together sort of replacing Google Play or Google Music. I went through a whole migration process recently. But that is a thing that you can now use and subscribe with. Uh, we are out there. So please, however you want to find us, you know, Podchaser, whatever, subscribe, like us, review us. It helps us quite a bit. From all of us here at Saving the Game, have a good one. Take it easy. We'll catch you next time. See you later, folks. See ya. This has been a production of Saving the Game. All episodes are produced and published under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, share-alike license. Our logo is by Ruben Smith Zimple of 3d6design.com. Our music is The Promised Place Beyond the Clouds by James Opie. You can find more of his music at nihilore.com. To hear our past episodes, to find syndication and license details, to connect with our fantastic listener community, or to contact us or support our show through Patreon, visit our website at stgcast.org or savingthegamepodcast.org. God bless, do good, and happy gaming.